Anselmo by James Whitcomb Riley, read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. Years did I vainly seek the good Lord's grace, prayed, fasted, and did penance dire and dread, did kneel with bleeding knees and rainy face, and mouth the dust with ashes on my head. Yea, still with knotted scourge and flesh I flayed, rent fresh the wounds, and moaned and shrieked insanely and froth oozed with the pleadings that i made and yet i prayed on vainly 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 a time from out of swoon i lifted eye to watch a wretched outcast gray and grim bathing my brow with many a pity and sigh and i did pray god's grace might rest on him then lo a gentle voice fell on mine ears thou shalt not sob in suppliance hereafter Take up thy prayers, and wring them dry of tears, And lift them white and pure with love and laughter. So is it now for all men else, I pray. So is it I am blessed and glad alway. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Berkshire Lady's Garland in Four Parts by Anonymous Read for LibriVox.org by Devorah Allen. Part One, showing Cupid's conquest over a coy lady of five thousand a year. Bachelors of every station, mark this strange and true relation, which in brief to you I bring, never was a stranger thing. You shall find it worth the hearing, loyal love is most endearing, when it takes the deepest root, yielding charms and gold to boot. Some will wed for love of treasure, but the sweetest joy and pleasure is in faithful love you'll find, graced with a noble mind. Such a noble disposition had this lady with submission, of whom I this sonnet write, store of wealth and beauty bright. She had left by a good granum full five thousand pounds per annum, which she held without control. Thus she did in riches roll. Though she had vast store of riches, which some persons much bewitches, yet she bore a virtuous mind, not the least to pride inclined. Many noble persons courted this young lady, tis reported, but their labor proved in vain, they could not her favor gain. Though she made a strong resistance, yet by Cupid's true assistance she was conquered after all. How it was, declare I shall. Being at a noble wedding, near the famous town of Reading, a young gentleman she saw, who belonged to the law. As she viewed his sweet behavior, every courteous carriage gave her new addition to her grief, forced she was to seek relief. Privately she then inquired about him so much admired, both his name and where he dwelt, such was the hot flame she felt. Then at night this youthful lady called her coach, which being ready, homeward straight she did return but her heart with flames did burn. Part 2. Showing the lady's letter of a challenge to fight him upon his refusing to wed her in a mask, without knowing who she was. Night and morning for a season, in her closet would she reason with herself, and often said, Why has love my heart betrayed? I that have so many slighted, am at length so well requited, for my griefs are not a few. Now I find what love can do. He that has my heart in keeping, though I for his sake be weeping, little knows what grief I feel, but I'll try it out with steel. For I will a challenge send him, and a point where I'll attend him, in a grove without delay by the dawning of the day. He shall not the least discover that I am a virgin lover, by the challenge which I send, but for justice I contend. He has caused sad distraction, and I come for satisfaction, which, if he denies to give, one of us shall cease to live. Having thus her mind revealed, she her letter closed and sealed, which, when it came to his hand, the young man was at a stand. In her letter she conjured him for to meet, and well assured him recompense he must afford, or dispute it with the sword. Having read this strange relation, he was in a consternation, but advising with his friend, he persuades him to attend. Be of courage and make ready. Faint heart never won, fair lady. In regard it must be so. 
I along with you must go. Part 3. Showing how they met by appointment in a grove, where she obliged him to fight or wed her. Early on a summer's morning, when bright Phoebus was adorning every bower with his beams, the fair lady came, it seems. At the bottom of a mountain, near a pleasant crystal fountain, there she left her gilded coach, while the grove she did approach. Covered with her mask and walking, there she met her lover talking with a friend that he had brought, so she asked him whom he sought. I am challenged by a gallant, who resolves to try my talent. Who he is I cannot say, but I hope to show him play. It is I that did invite you. You shall wed me, or I'll fight you, underneath those spreading trees. Therefore choose you which you please. You shall find I do not vapor. I have brought my trusty rapier. Therefore take your choice, said she. Either fight or marry me. Said he, Madam, pray what mean you? In my life I've never seen you. Pray unmask your visage show. Then I'll tell you I or no. I will not my face uncover till the marriage ties are over. Therefore choose you which you will. Wed me, sir, or try your skill. Step within that pleasant bower with your friend one single hour. Strive your thoughts to reconcile, and I'll wander here the while. While this beauteous lady waited, the young bachelors debated what was best for to be done. Quoth his friend, the hazard run. If my judgment can be trusted, wed her first, you can't be worsted. If she's rich, you'll rise to fame. If she's poor, why, you're the same. He consented to be married. All three in a coach were carried to a church without delay, where he weds the lady gay. Though sweet pretty cupids hovered round her eyes, her face was covered with a mask. He took her thus, just for better or for worse. With a courteous, kind behavior, she presents his friend a favor, and withal dismissed him straight, that he might no longer wait. Part 4. Showing how they rode together in her gilded coach to her noble seat, or castle, etc. As the gilded coach stood ready, the young lawyer and his lady rode together till they came to her house of state and fame, which appeared like a castle, where you might behold a parcel of young cedars tall and straight just before her palace gate. Hand in hand they walked together, to a hall, or parlour rather, which was beautiful and fair. All alone she left him there. Two long hours there he waited, her return, at length he fretted, and began to grieve at last, for he had not broke his fast. Still he sat like one amazed, round a spacious room he gazed, which was richly beautified, but alas, he lost his bride. There was peeping, laughing, sneering, all within the lawyer's hearing, but his bride he could not see. Would I were at home, thought he. While his heart was melancholy, said the steward, brisk and jolly, Tell me, friend, how came you here? You've some bad design, I fear. He replied, Dear loving master, you shall meet with no disaster through my means in any case. Madam brought me to this place. Then the steward did retire, saying that he would inquire whether it was true or no, ne'er was lover hampered so. Now the lady who had filled him with those fears full well beheld him from a window as she dressed, pleased at the merry jest. When she had herself attired in rich robes to be admired, she appeared in his sight like a moving angel bright. Sir, my servants have related how some hours you have waited in my parlour. Tell me who in my house you ever knew. Madam, if I have offended, it is more than I intended. A young lady brought me here. That is true, said she, my dear. I can be no longer cruel to my joy and only jewel. Thou art mine, and I am thine. Hand and heart I do resign. Once I was a wounded lover. Now these fears are fairly over. By receiving what I gave, thou art lord of what I have. Beauty, honor, love, and treasure, a rich golden stream of pleasure, with his lady he enjoys, thanks to Cupid's kind decoys. Now he's clothed in rich attire, not inferior to a squire. Beauty, honor, riches store, what can man desire more? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Death by James Lay Hunt. Read for LibriVox.org by Campbell Shelp. Death is a road our dearest friends have gone. 
why with such leaders fear to say lead on its gate repels lest it too soon be tried but turns in balm on the immortal side mothers have passed it fathers children men whose like we look not to behold again women that smiled away their loving breath soft is the travelling on the road to death but guilt has passed it men not fit to die oh hush for he that made us all is by human were all all men all born of mothers all our own selves in the worn-out shape of others our used and oh be sure not to be ill-used brothers end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Dog by Ivan Turgenev Read for LibriVox.org by Ian King Us two in the room, my dog and me. Outside, a fearful storm is howling. The dog sits in front of me and looks me straight in the face. And I, too, look into his face. He wants, it seems, to tell me something. He is dumb, he is without words, he does not understand himself. But I understand him. I understand that at this instant there is living in him and in me the same feeling, that there is no difference between us. We are the same. In each of us there burns and shines the same trembling spark. Death sweeps down with a wave of its chill broad wing, and the end. Who then can discern what was the spark that glowed in each of us? No, we are not beast and man that glance at one another. They are the eyes of equals, those eyes riveted on one another. And in each of these, in the beast and in the man, the same life huddles up in fear, close to the other. February 1878 End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ecstasy by Sarojini Naidu Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter Cover mine eyes, O oh my love, mine eyes that are weary of bliss, as of light that is poignant and strong. O oh, silence my lips with a kiss, my lips that are weary of song. Shelter my soul, O oh my love, my soul is bent low with the pain and the burden of love, like the grace of a flower that is smitten with rain. O oh, shelter my soul from thy face. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Encouragement by Friedrich Hebel Read for LibriVox.org by Newgate Novelist O oh, thou mysterious human heart, from which a spring of life there gleams which in itself endures the smart of thirst until one quaffs its streams wait not the world's unkindly nod but be prepared to meet its worst thou art a beaker filled for god and none but he can quench thy thirst end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Famous Flower of Serving Man by Anonymous Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia The Famous Flower of Serving Man You beauteous ladies, great and small, I write unto you one and all, whereby that you may understand what I have suffered in this land. I was by birth a lady fair, my father's chief and only heir, but when my good old father died, then was I made a young knight's bride. 
and then my love built me a bower bedecked with many a fragrant flower a braver bower you never did see than my true love did build for me but there came thieves late in the night they robbed my bower and slew my knight and after that my knight was slain i could no longer there remain my servants all from me did fly in the midst of my extremity and left me by myself alone with a heart more cold than any stone yet though my heart was full of care heaven would not suffer me to despair wherefore in haste i changed my name from fair elise to sweet william and therewithal i cut my hair and dressed myself in man's attire my doublet hose and beaverhead and a golden band about my neck with a silver rapier by my side so like a gallant i did ride the thing that i delighted on was for to be a serving man thus in my sumptuous man's array i bravely rode along the way and at the last it chanced so that i unto the king's court did go then to the king i bowed full low my love and duty for to show and so much favour i did crave that i a serving man's place might have stand up brave youth the king replied thy service shall not be denied but tell me first what thou canst do thou shalt be fitted thereunto wilt thou be usher of my hall to wait upon my nobles all or wilt thou be taster of my wine to wait on me when i shall dine or wilt thou be my chamberlain to make my bed both soft and fine or wilt thou be one of my guard and i will give thee thy reward sweet william with a smiling face said to the king if please your grace to show such favour unto me your chamberlain i fain would be the king then did the nobles call to ask the counsel of them all who gave consent sweet william he the king's own chamberlain should be now mark what strange things came to pass as the king one day a hunting was with all his lords and noble train sweet william did at home remain sweet william had no company then with him at home but an old man and when he saw the coast was clear he took a lute which he had there upon the lute sweet william played and to the same he sung and said with a pleasant and most noble voice which made the old man to rejoice my father was as brave a lord as ever europe did afford my mother was a lady bright my husband was a valiant knight and i myself a lady gay bedecked with gorgeous rich array the bravest lady in the land had not more pleasures to command i had my music every day harmonious lessons for to play i had my virgins fair and free continually to wait on me but now alas my husband's dead and all my friends are from me fled my former joys are past and gone for now i am a serving man at last the king from hunting came and presently upon the same he called it for the good old man and thus to speak the king began what news what news old man quoth he what news hast thou to tell to me brave news the old man he did say sweet william is a lady gay if this be true thou tellest me i'll make thee a lord of high degree but if thy words do prove a lie thou shalt be hanged up presently but when the king the truth had found his joys did more and more abound according as the old man did say sweet william was a lady gay therefore the king without delay put on her glorious rich array and upon her head a crown of gold which was most famous to behold and then for fear of further strife he took sweet william for his wife the like before was never seen a serving man to be a queen 
End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Flower by George Herbert Read for LibriVox.org by Phil Schempf How fresh, O oh Lord, how sweet and clean are thy returns, Even as the flowers in spring, To which, besides their own demean, The late past frosts tributes of pleasure bring. Grief melts away like snow in May, As if there were no such cold thing who would have thought my shrivelled heart could have recovered greenness it was gone quite underground as flowers depart to see their mother root when they have blown where they together all the hard weather dead to the world keep house unknown these are thy wonders lord of power killing and quickening bringing down to hell and up to heaven in an hour making a chiming of a passing bell we say amiss this or that is thy word is all if we could spell o oh, that i once past changing were fast in thy paradise where no flower can wither many a spring i shoot up fair offering at heaven growing and groaning thither nor doth my flower want a spring shower my sins and i joining together but while i grow in a straight line still upwards bent as if heaven were mine own thy anger comes and i decline what frost to that what pole is not the zone where all things burn when thou dost turn and the least frown of thine is shown and now in age i bud again after so many deaths i live and write i once more smell the dew and rain and relish versing o oh, my only light it cannot be that i am he on whom thy tempests fell all night these are thy wonders lord of love to make us see we are but flowers that glide which when we once can find and prove thou hast a garden for us where to bide who would be more swelling through store forfeit their paradise by their pride end of poem this recording is in the public domain Friedleif and Helga by Adam Olenschlager, translated into English by George Borrow. The woods were in leaf, and they cast a sweet shade. Among them walked Helga, the beautiful maid. The water is dashing o'er yon little stones. She sat down beside it and rested her bones. She sat down, and soon, from a bush that was near, Sir Friedleif approached her with sword and with spear. Ah, pity me, Helga, and fly me not now. I live, only live, on the smile of thy brow. In thy father's whole garden is found not a rose, which bright as thyself and as beautiful grows. Sir Fridleif, thy words are but meant to deceive, yet tell me what brings thee so late here at eve. I cannot find rest, and I cannot find ease, though sweet sing the linnets among the wild trees. If thou wilt but promise one day to be mine, no more shall I sorrow, no more shall I pine. She sank in his arms, and her cheeks were as red as the sun when he sinks in his watery bed. But soon she arose from his loving embrace. He walked by her side through the wood for a space. Now listen, young Fridleif, the gallant and bold. Take off from my finger this ring of red gold. Take off from my finger this ring of red gold, and part with it not, till in death thou art cold. Sir Fridleif stood there in a sorrowful plight. Salt tears wet his eyeballs and blinded his sight. Go home, and I'll come to thy father with speed, and claim thee from him on my mighty grey steed. Sir Fridleif at night through the thick forest rode, he fain would arrive at his loved one's abode. His harness was clanking, his helm glittered sheen, his horse was so swift and himself was so keen. He reached the proud castle and jumped on the ground, his horse to the branch of a linden he bound. He shouldered his mantle of grey otter skin, and through the wide door to Sir Eric went in. Here sittest thou, Sir Eric, in scarlet arrayed. I've wedded thy daughter, the beautiful maid. And who art thou, rider? What feat hast thou done? No nidering coward shall e'er be my son. O oh, far have I wandered, renowned is my name, the heroes I conquered wherever I came. Han Elland, tis true, long disputed the ground, 
but yet he received from my hand his death wound. Sir Eric then altered his countenance quite, and out hurried he in the gloom of the night. Fill high, little Kirsten, my best drinking cup, and be the brown liquor with poison mixed up. She gave him the draught, and returning with speed, Young gallant, said he, thou must taste my old mead. Sir Fridleaf unbuckled his helmet and drank. Sweat sprung from his forehead, his features grew blank. I never have drained since the day I was born a bitterer draught from a costlier horn. My course is completed, my life is summed up, for treason I smell in the dregs of the cup. Sir Eric then said, while he stamped on the ground, Young knight, tis thy fortune to die like a hound. My best beloved friend thou didst boast to have slain, and I have avenged him by giving thee bane. Not Helga but Hela shall now be thy bride. Dark blue are her cheeks, and she looks stony-eyed. Sir Eric, thy words are both witty and wise, and hell, when it has thee, will have a rich prize. Convey unto Helga her gold ring so red. Be sure to inform her when Fridleaf is dead. But flame shall give water, and marble shall bleed, before thou shalt win by this treacherous deed. And I will not die like a hound in the straw, but go like a hero to Odin and Thor. He cut himself thrice with his keen cutting glaive, and went to Valhalla the way of the brave. The knight bade his daughter come into the room. Look here, my sweet child, on thy merry bridegroom. She looked on the body and gave a wild start. Oh, father, why hadst thou so cruel a heart? She moaned and lamented, she raved and she cursed, she looked on her love till her very eyes burst. At midnight Sir Eric was standing there mute, with two pallid courses beside his cold foot. He stood stiff and still, and when morning light came he stood like a post without life in his frame. The youth and the maid were together interred, Sir Eric could not from his posture be stirred. He stood there as stiffly for thirty long days, and looked on the earth with a petrified gaze. Tis said, on the night of the thirtieth long day, to dust and to ashes he mouldered away. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Golden Day by Ella Wheeler Wilcox Read for LibriVox.org by Sam Haddad the subtle beauty of this day hangs o'er me like a fairy spell, and care and grief have flown away, and every breeze sings, all is well. I ask, holds earth or sin or woe? My heart replies, I do not know. Nay, all we know or feel, my heart, today is joy undimmed, complete. In tears or pain we have no part, the act of breathing is so sweet. We care no higher joy to name, what reck we now of wealth or fame. The past, what matters it to me? The pain it gave has passed away. The future, that I cannot see. I care for nothing, save today. This is a respite from all care, and trouble flies I know not where. Go on, O noisy, restless life. Pass by, O feet, that seek for heights. I have no part in aught of strife. I do not want your vain delights. The day wraps round me like a spell, and every breeze sings, all is well. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Jack Jingle and Sucky Shingle by Anonymous Read for LibriVox.org by phone. A delightful tale that will not fail to please you all, both great and small. Little Jack Jingle played truant at school. They made his bum tingle for being a fool. He promised no more like a fool he would look, but be a good boy and stick close to his book. Here's Silky Sue, what shall we do? Turn her face to the wall until she comes to. If that should fail, a smart touch with the cane will soon make her good when she feels the pain. See little Jack Jingle learning his task. 
he's a very good boy if the neighbor should ask to school he does run and no truant does play but when school is done he can laugh and be gay now sucky never pouts never frowns never flouts but reads her book with glee then dances merrily no girl as good as she in all the country cheerfully doeth all things do she's lost the name of sulky sue jack jingle went prentice to make a horseshoe he wasted the iron till it would not do his master came in and began for to rail says jack the shoe is spoiled but twill yet make a nail he tried at the nail but chancing to miss says if it won't make a nail it will still make a hiss then into the water threw the iron smack hiss quoth the iron i thought so says jack suki shingle when young did as others have done she could dirty two clouts while her mother washed one but now grown a stout wench with her pail and her mop if she don't clean the boards she can make a great slop now what do you think of little jack jingle before he was married he used to live single but after he married to alter his life he left off living single and lived with his wife little jack jingle went to court sucky shingle says he we will mingle our toes in the bed fie jacky jingle says little sucky shingle we must try to mingle our pence for some bread sucky you shall be my wife and i'll tell you why i've got a little pig and you have got a sty i've got a dun cow and you can make good cheese sucky will you have me say yes if you please sucky she made answer for your cow and pig i'll tell you jacky jingle i do not care a fig i have got a puppy dog and a pussy cat and i have got another thing that's better far than that for i have got a velvet purse that holds a hundred pounds twas left me by my grannum who now lies underground so if your cow and pig is all you have in store you may go home and mind em for now your wooing's o'er says jack you're too hasty i've got a horse and cart and i've got a better thing i've got a constant heart then if that won't do you may lay mouldy on the shelf i soon shall get another girl that's better than yourself then say little sue if your heart be true this trouble will get through if things are rightly carried there's nothing more to do twixt jacky and sue none so happy as we two for now we'll both be married now after they were married some good things to produce sucky's purse and hundred pounds were quickly put in use sucky milked the cow and to make good cheese did try jack drove the horse and cart and minded pig and sty end of poem this recording is in the public domain the life and age of man by anonymous read for LibriVox.org by phil Schempf. in prime of years when i was young i took delight in youthful ways not knowing then what did belong unto the pleasures of those days at seven years old i was a child and subject then to be beguiled at two times seven i went to learn what discipline is taught at school when good from ill i could discern i thought myself no more a fool my parents were contriving then how i might live when i were man at three times seven i waxed wild when manhood led me to be bold i thought myself no more a child my own conceit it so me told then did i venture far and near to buy delight at price full dear at four times seven i take a wife and leave off all my wanton ways thinking thereby perhaps to thrive and save myself from sad disgrace so farewell my companions all for other business doth me call at five times seven i must hard strive what i could gain by mighty skill 
but still against the stream i drive and bowl up stones against the hill the more i laboured might and main the more i strove against the stream at six times seven all covetized began to harbour in my breast my mind still then contriving was how i might gain this worldly wealth to purchase lands and live on them so make my children mighty men at seven times seven all worldly thought began to harbour in my brain then did i drink a heavy draught of water of experience plain there none so ready was as i to purchase bargains sell or buy at eight times seven i waxed old and took myself unto my rest neighbors then sought my counsel bold and i was held in great request but age did so abate my strength that i was forced to yield at length at nine times seven take my leave of former vain delights must i it then full sorely did me grieve i fetched many a heavy sigh to rise up early and sit up late my former life i loathe and hate at ten times seven my glass is run and i poor silly man must die i look it up and saw the sun had overcome the crystal sky so now i must this world forsake another man my place must take now you may see as in a glass the whole estate of mortal men how they from seven to seven do pass until they are threescore and ten and when their glass is fully run they must leave off as they begun and a poem this recording is in the public domain the lifesaver by joseph c lincoln read for LibriVox.org by larry wilson dedicated to the men in the united states life-saving service when the lord breathes his wrath above the bosom of the waters when the rollers are a-pounding on the shore when the mariners are thinking of his wife and sons and daughters and the little home he'll maybe see no more when the bars are white and yeasty and the shoals are full of frothem when the wild nor'easter cuttin like a knife through the seething roar and screech he's patrolling on the beach the government's hired man for saving life he's struggling with the gusts that strike and bruise him like a hammer he's fightin sand that stings like swarmin bees he's listenin through the whirlwind and the thunder and the clamor a listenin for the signal from the seas he's breakin ribs and bustles launchin lifeboats in the surges he's drippin wet and chilled in every bone he's bringin men from death back ter flesh and blood and breath and he never stops ter think about his own he's a pullin at an oar that is freezin to his fingers he's a clingin in the riggin of a wreck he knows destruction's near every minute that he lingers but it don't appear to worry him a speck he's draggin draggled corpses from the clutches of the combers the kind of job a common chap would shirk but he takes em from the wave and he fits em for the grave and he thinks it's all included in his work he's a rigger rower swimmer sailor doctor undertaker and he's good at every one of em the same and he risks his life for others in the quicksand and the breaker and a thousand wives and mothers bless his name he's an angel dressed in oilskins he's a saint in a sou'wester he's as plucky as they make or ever can he's a hero born and bred but it hasn't swelled his head and he's just the u s government's hired man End of poem. this recording is in the public domain Life's Tragedy by Paul Lawrence Dunbar Read for LibriVox.org by Hugh Michael It may be misery not to sing at all And to go silent through the brimming day It may be misery never to be loved But deeper griefs than these beset the way To sing the perfect song And by a half-tone lost the key There the potent sorrow, there the grief the pale, sad staring of life's tragedy. To have come near to the perfect love, not the hot passion of untempered youth, but that which lies aside its vanity and gives for thy trusting worship 
truth. This, this indeed is to be accursed, for if we mortals love or if we sing, we count our joys not by what we have, but by what kept us from that perfect thing. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Litany of Atlanta by W. E. B. Du Bois Read for LibriVox.org by Josh Kibbe Done at Atlanta in the Day of Death, 1906 O oh, silent God, thou whose voice afar in mist and mystery hath left our ears and hungered in these fearful days, hear us, good Lord. Listen to us, thy children. Our faces dark with doubt are made a mockery in thy sanctuary. With uplifted hands we front thy heaven, O God, crying, We beseech thee to hear us, good Lord. We are not better than our fellows, Lord, we are but weakened human men. When our devils do deviltry, curse thou the doer and the deed. Curse them as we curse them. Do to them all and more than ever they have done to innocence and weakness, to womanhood and home. Have mercy upon us, miserable sinners. And yet whose is the deeper guilt? Who made these devils? Who nursed them in crime and fed them on injustice? Who ravished and debauched their mothers and their grandmothers? Who bought and sold their crime and waxed fat and rich on public iniquity? Thou knowest, good God. Is this thy justice, O Father, that guile be easier than innocence, and the innocent crucified for the guilt of the untouched guilty? Justice, O judge of men! Wherefore do we pray? Is not the God of the fathers dead? Have not seers seen in heaven's halls thine hearsed and lifeless form, stark amidst the black and rolling smoke of sin, where all along bow bitter forms of endless dead? Awake, thou that sleepest! Thou art not dead, but flown afar, up hills of endless light, through blazing corridors of suns, where worlds do swing of good and gentlemen, of women strong and free, far from the cousinage, black hypocrisy, and chaste prostitution of this shameful speck of dust. Turn again, O Lord, leave us not to perish in our sin. From lust of body and lust of blood, great God, deliver us. From lust of power and lust of gold, great God, deliver us. From the leagued line of despot and of brute, Great God, deliver us. A city lay in travail, God our Lord, and from her loins sprang twin murder and black hate. Red was the midnight, clang, crack, and cry of death, and fury filled the air, and it trembled underneath the stars when church spires pointed silently to thee. And all this was to sate the greed of greedy men who hide behind the veil of vengeance. Bend us thine ear, O Lord. In the pale, still morning we looked upon the deed, we stopped our ears and held our leaping hands, but they, did they not wag their heads and leer and cry with bloody jaws, cease from crime? The word was mockery, for thus they train a hundred crimes while we do cure one. Turn again our captivity, O Lord. Behold this maimed and broken thing. Dear God, it was an humble black man who toiled and sweat to save a bit from the pittance paid him. They told him, work and rise. He worked. Did this man sin? Nay, but someone told how someone said another did, one whom he had never seen nor known, yet for that man's crime this man lieth maimed and murdered, his wife naked to shame, his children to poverty and evil. Hear us, O heavenly Father. Doth not this justice of hell stink in thy nostrils, O God? How long shall the mounting flood of innocent blood roar in thine ears and pound in our hearts for vengeance? Pile the pale frenzy of blood-crazed brutes who do such deeds high on thine altar, Jehovah Jireh, and burn it in hell for ever and for ever. Forgive us, good Lord, we know not what we say. Bewildered we are, and passion-tossed, mad with the madness of a mobbed and mocked and murdered people, straining at the armposts of thy throne, we raise our shackled hands and charge thee, God, by the bones of our stolen fathers, by the tears of our dead mothers, by the very blood of thy crucified Christ. What meaneth this? Tell us the plan. Give us the sign. Keep not thou silence, O God. Sit no longer blind, Lord God, deaf to our prayer and dumb to our dumb suffering. Surely thou art not white, O Lord, a pale, bloodless, heartless thing. Ah, Christ of the pities. Forgive the thought. Forgive these wild, blasphemous words. Thou art still the God of our black fathers, and in thy soul's soul sit some soft darkenings of the evening, some shadowings of the velvet night. But whisper, Speak, call, great God, for thy silence is white terror to our hearts. The way, O God, show us the way and point us the path. Whither? North is greed and south is blood, within the coward and without the liar. Whither? To death? 
Amen. Welcome, dark sleep. Whither? To life? But not this life, dear God, not this. Let the cup pass from us. Tempt us not beyond our strength, for there is that clamoring and clawing within, to whose voice we would not listen, yet shudder lest we must. And it is red, ah, God, it is a red and awful shape. Selah. In yonder east trembles a star. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Thy will, O Lord, be done. Kyrie Lord, we have done these pleading, wavering words. We beseech thee to hear us, good Lord. We bow our heads and hearken soft to the sobbing of women and little children. We beseech thee to hear us, good Lord. Our voices sink in silence and in night. Hear us, good Lord. In night, O God of a godless land. Amen. In silence, O silent God. Selah. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. London, 1802, by William Wordsworth, read for LibriVox.org, by Sonia. London, 1802. Milton, thou shouldst be living at this hour. England hath need of thee. She is a fen of stagnant waters. Altar, sword, and pen, fireside, the heroic wealth of hall and bower, have forfeited their ancient English dower of inward happiness. We are selfish men. Oh, raise us up, return to us again, and give us manners, virtue, freedom, power. Thy soul was like a star, and dwelt apart. Thou hadst a voice whose sound was like the sea, pure as the naked heavens, majestic, free. So didst thou travel on life's common way, in cheerful godliness and yet thy heart the lowliest duties on herself did lay end of poem this recording is in the public domain the man who dreamed of fairyland by william butler yeats read for librivox dot org by rapunzelina he stood among a crowd and drama hair. His heart hung all upon a silken dress, and he had known at last some tenderness before earth made of him her sleepy care. But when a man poured fish into a pile, it seemed they raised their little silver heads and sung how day a drear twilight sheds upon a dim green well-beloved isle where people love beside star-laden seas. How time may never mar their fairy vows, under the woven roofs of quickened boughs, the singing shook him out of his new ease. As he went by the sands of Liza Dill, his mind ran all on money, cares and fears, and he had known at last some prudent years before they heaped his grave under the hill. But while he passed before a plushy place, a lugworm with its grey and muddy mouth sang how somewhere to north or west or south there dwelt a gay, exulting, gentle race, and how beneath those three times blessed skies a Danaean fruitage makes a shower of moons and as it falls awakens leafy tunes, and at that singing he was no more wise. He mused beside the well of Scanavine, he mused upon his mockers, without fail his sudden vengeance were a country tale, now that deep earth has drunk his body in. But one small knot grass growing by the pool told where a oh, little all unneeded voice old silence bids a lonely folk rejoice and chaplet their calm brows with leafage cool and how when fades the sea strewn rose of day a gentle feeling wraps them like a fleece and all their trouble dies into its peace the tale drove his fine angry mood away he slept under the hill of Lugnagol, 
and might have known at last unhaunted sleep under that cold and vapour turbid steep now that old earth had taken man and all were not the worms that spired about his bones a telling with their low and reedy cry of how god leans his hands out of the sky to bless that isle with honey in his tones that none may fill the power of squall and wave and no one any leaf-crowned dancer miss until he burn up nature with a kiss the man has found no comfort in the grave end of poem this recording is in the public domain Morning and Evening by Friedrich Hebel Read for LibriVox.org by Newgate Novelist O oh, morning hours, O oh, morning tide Of life the fountain flowing Thou makest the narrow heart grow wide The dim eye bright and glowing It seems as I could wake and rise From out all bygone sadness when thy first beams delight my eyes and i inhale thy gladness then swells my heart as twere a seed with thousand new-born powers which mount and soar aloft and breed delights for morning hours their joyous interchange of bliss with hopes my soul is thrilling and so it is that morning's kiss with hope the world is filling but ah the world is limitless and as the heart is longing and feels at best its littleness tears to my eyes come thronging then sinks the evening's holy peace upon this human sorrow and bids these pangs of heart to cease with hopes of brighter morrow enough the strength of human life for fight for triumph never we must not in the endless strife stand still or cease endeavour still if the toil exhaust our powers the slumber comes to-morrow and if the final wish be ours the first need cause no sorrow end of poem this recording is in the public domain. My Pony by Anonymous Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia My Pony My pony tossed his sprightly head And would have smiled, if smile he could, To thank me for the slice of bread He thinks so delicate and good. His eye is very bright and wild, he looks as if he loved me so, although I only am a child, and he's a real horse, you know. How charming it would be to rear and have hind legs to balance on, of hay and oats within the year to leisurely devour a ton, to stoop my head and quench my drouth with water in a lovely pail, to wear a snaffle in my mouth, fling back my ears and slash my tail to gallop madly round the field who tries to catch me is a goose and then with dignity to yield my stately back for riders use to feel as only horses can when matters take their proper course and no one notices the man while loud applauses greet the horse he canters fast or ambles slow and either is a pretty game his duties are but pleasures, oh, I wish that mine were just the same. Lessons would be another thing, if I might turn from book and scroll, and learn to gallop round the ring, as he did when a little foal. It must be charming to be shod, and beautiful beyond my praise, when tired of rolling on the sod, to stand upon all fours and grace. Alas, my dreams are weak and wild. I must not ape my better so. Alas, I only am a child, and he's a real horse, you know. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
Ode on Intimations of Immortality from Recollections of Early Childhood by William Wordsworth. Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. There was a time when meadow, grove, and stream, the earth and every common sight to me did seem apparelled in celestial light, the glory and the freshness of a dream. It is not now as it hath been of yore. Turn wheresoe'er I may, by night or day, the things which I have seen, I can now see no more. The rainbow comes and goes, and lovely is the rose. The moon doth with delight look round her when the heavens are bare. Waters on a starry night are beautiful and fair. The sunshine is a glorious birth. But yet I know where I go, that there hath passed away a glory from the earth. Now, while the birds thus sing a joyous song, and while the young lambs bound as to the tabor's sound, to me alone there came a thought of grief. A timely utterance gave that thought relief, and I again am strong. The cataracts blow their trumpets from the steep. No more shall grief of mine, the seasons wrong. I hear the echoes through the mountains throng. The winds come to me from the fields of sleep, and all the earth is gay. Land and sea give themselves up to jollity, and with the heart of May doth every beast keep holiday. Thou child of joy, shout round me, let me hear thy shouts, thou happy shepherd boy. Ye blessed creatures, I have heard the call ye to each other make. I see the heavens laugh with you in their jubilee. My heart is at your festival, my head hath its corona. The fullness of your bliss I feel, I feel it all. O oh, evil day, if I were sullen while earth herself is adorning this sweet May morning, and the children are calling on every side, in a thousand valleys far and wide, fresh flowers, while the sun shines warm and the babe leaps up on his mother's arm, I hear, I hear, with joy I hear. But there's a tree of many, one in a single field, which I have looked upon, both of them speak of something that is gone. The pansy at my feet doth the same tale repeat. Whether is fled the visionary gleam? Where is it now the glory and the dream? Our birth is but a sleep and a forgetting. The soul that rises with us, our life's star, hath had elsewhere its setting, and cometh from afar. Not in entire forgetfulness, and not in utter nakedness, but trailing clouds of glory do we come from God, who is our home. Heaven lies about us in our infancy. Shades of the prison house begin to close upon the growing boy. But he beholds the light, and whence it flows he sees it in his joy. The youth who daily farther from the east must travel, still is nature's priest, and by the vision splendid is on his way attended. At length the man perceives it die away, and fade into the light of common day. Earth fills her lap with pleasures of her own, yearning she hath in her own natural kind, and even with something of a mother's mind, and no worthy aim, the homely nurse doth all she can to make her foster child, her inmate man, forget the glories he hath known, and that imperial palace whence he came. Behold, the child among his newborn blisses, a six years darling of pygmy size, see where mid work of his own hand he lies fretted by sallies of his mother's kisses with light upon him from his father's eyes see at his feet some little plan or chart some fragment from his dream of human life shaped by himself with newly learned art a wedding or a festival a mourning or a funeral and this hath now his heart and unto this he frames his song then will he fit his tongue to dialogues of business, love, or strife. But it will not be long ere this be thrown aside, and with new joy and pride the little actor cons another part, filling from time to time his humorous stage with all the persons down to palsied age that life brings with her in her equipage, as if his whole vocation were endless imitation. Thou, whose exterior semblance doth belie thy soul's immensity, Thou best philosopher who yet dost keep thy heritage, thou I among the blind, that deaf and silent readest the eternal deep, haunted forever by the eternal mind. Mighty prophet, 
seer blessed on whom those truths do rest which we are toiling all our lives to find in darkness lost the darkness of the grave thou over whom thy immortality broods like the day a master or a slave a presence which is not to be put by thou little child yet glorious in the might of heaven-born freedom on thy being's height why with such earnest pains dost thou provoke the years to bring the inevitable yoke thus blindly with thy blessedness at strife full soon thy soul shall have her earthly freight and custom lie upon thee with a weight heavy as frost and deep almost as life o oh, joy that in our embers is something that doth live that nature yet remembers what was so fugitive the thought of our past years in me doth breed perpetual benediction not indeed for that which is most worthy to be blessed delight and liberty the simple creed of childhood whether busy or at rest with new-fledged hope still fluttering in his breast not for these i raise the song of thanks and praise but for those obstinate questionings of sense and outward things fallings from us vanishings blank misgivings of a creature moving about in worlds not realized high instincts before which our mortal nature did tremble like a guilty thing surprised but for those first affections those shadowy recollections which be they what they may are yet the fountain light of all our day and yet a master light of all our sea uphold us cherish and have power to make our noisy years seem moments in the being of the eternal silence truths that wake to perish never which neither listlessness nor mad endeavour nor man nor boy nor all that is at enmity with joy can utterly abolish or destroy hence in a season of calm weather though inland far we be our souls have sight of that immortal sea which brought us hither can in a moment travel thither and see the children sport upon the shore and hear the mighty waters rolling evermore then sing ye birds sing sing a joyous song and let the young lambs bound as to the tabor sound we and thought will join your throng ye that pipe and ye that play ye that through your hearts to-day feel the gladness of the may what though the radiance which was once so bright be now for ever taken from my sight though nothing can bring back the hour of splendour in the grass of glory in the flower we will grieve not rather find strength in what remains behind in the primal sympathy which having been must ever be in the soothing thoughts that spring out of human suffering in the faith that looks through death in years that bring the philosophic mind and o oh, ye fountains meadows hills and groves forebode not any severing of our loves yet in my heart of hearts i feel your might i only have relinquished one delight to live beneath your more habitual sway i love the brooks which down their channels fret even more than when i tripped lightly as they the innocent brightness of a new-born day is lovely yet the clouds that gather round the setting sun do take a sober colouring from an eye that hath kept watch o'er man's mortality another race hath been and other palms are won thanks to the human heart by which we live thanks to its tenderness its joys and fears to me the meanest flower that blows can give thoughts that do often lie too deep for tears in the poem this recording is in the public domain of all the Erks by robert burns read for LibriVox.org by david glover of all the airts the wind can blow, I dearly like the west, For there the bonny lassie lives, the lassie I love best. There's wild woods grow, and rivers row, and mony a hill between, But day and night my fancy's flight is ever with my jean. I see her in the dewy flowers, I see her sweet and fair, I hear her in the tuneful birds, I hear her charm the air. There's not a bonny flower that springs by fountain, shaw, or green. That's not a bonny bird that sings, but minds me o' my jean. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
On a Favorite Cat Drowned in a Tub of Goldfishes by Thomas Gray. Read for LibriVox.org by Jeffrey Wilson, Ames, Iowa. Twas on a lofty vase's side, where China's gayest art had dyed the azure flowers that blow, demurest of the tabby kind, the pensive Selima reclined, gazed on the lake below. Her conscious tale her joy declared, the fair round face, the snowy beard, the velvet of her paws, her coat that with the tortoise vies, her ears of jet and emerald eyes, she saw and purred applause. Still had she gazed, but midst the tide two angel forms were seen to glide, the genii of the stream. Their scaly armor's Tyrian hue threw richest purple to the view betrayed a golden gleam. The hapless nymph with wonder saw, a whisker first and then a claw, with many an ardent wish, she stretched in vain to reach the prize. What female heart can gold despise? What cat's averse to fish? Presumptuous maid, with looks intent, again she stretched, again she bent, nor knew the gulf between. Malignant fate sat by and smiled. The slippery verge her feet beguiled, she tumbled headlong in. Eight times emerging from the flood, she mewed to every watery god some speedy aid to send. No dolphin came, no nereid stirred, nor cruel Tom, nor Susan heard. A favorite has not friend. From hence, ye beauties undeceived, no one false step is ne'er retrieved, and be with caution bold. Not all that tempts your wandering eyes and heedless hearts is lawful prize, nor all that glisters gold. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Excerpt from The Botanic Garden by Erasmus Darwin, 1731 to 1802. Read for LibriVox.org. On an Icelandic Geyser. High in the frozen north, where Hecla glows and melts in torrents his coeval snows, or isles and oceans sheds a sanguine light or shoots red stars amid the ebon night when at his base entombed with bellowing sound fell geyser roared and struggling shook the ground poured from red nostrils with her scalding breath a boiling deluge o'er the blasted heath and wide in air in misty volumes hurled contagious atoms o'er the alarmed world nymphs your bold myriads broke the infernal spell and crushed the sorceress in her flinty cell where with soft fires in unextinguished urns cauldroned in rock innocuous lava burns on the bright lake your gullet hands distill in pearly moors the parsimonious rill and as aloft the curling vapors rise through the cleft roof ambitious for the skies in vaulted hills condense the tepid steams and pour to health the medicated streams so in green vales amid her mountains bleak buxtonia smiles the goddess nymph of peak deep in warm waves and pebbly baths she dwells and calls hygienia to her sainted wells end of poem this recording is in the public domain on the sight of a skull by mary molyneux read for LibriVox.org by josh kibbe Behold, ambitious lump of clay refined, thy epilogue, see, see, to what designed. So soon as thou wert born, so soon as air affords thee breath, thy vitals to repair, so soon as thy small feeble embryon breast is of an active power, 
unknown, possessed. So soon thou mayst expect the dreadful day when thou once more must be reduced to clay, and the whole fabric of thy body must again be brought to its first nothing, dust. Then shall those eyes, those crystal eyes of thine, which now like sparkling diamonds do shine, their little chamber circular forsake, and them to essence more obscure betake. The tender funnel of thy nose must thence corroded be, and lose its smelling sense, and all the volume of thy face will be so changed, none may thereby remember thee. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. On the Threshold by Amy Levi Read for LibriVox.org By Winston Tharp Oh, God, my dream! I dreamed that you were dead. Your mother hung above the couch and wept, whereon you lay all white and garlanded with blooms of waxen whiteness. I had crept up to your chamber door, which stood ajar, and in the doorway watched you from afar, nor dared advance to kiss your lips and brow. I had no part nor lot in you, as now. Death had not broken between us the old bar, nor torn from out my heart the old cold sense of your misprision and my impotence. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Pre-Existence by Francis Cornford Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter I laid me down upon the shore And dreamed a little space I heard the great waves break and roar The sun was on my face My idle hands and fingers brown Played with the pebbles grey The waves came up, the waves went down most thundering and gay. The pebbles, they were smooth and round, and warm upon my hands, like little people I had found sitting among the sands. The grains of sand so shining small, soft through my fingers ran. The sun shone down upon it all, and so my dream began. How all of this had been before, how ages far away I lay on some forgotten shore as here I lie today. The waves came shining up the sands as here today they shine, and in my pre pelasgian hands the sand was warm and fine. I have forgotten whence I came, or what my home might be, or by what strange and savage name I called that thundering sea. I only know the sun shone down, as still it shines today, and in my fingers long and brown the little pebbles lay. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Red Red Rose by Robert Burns Read for LibriVox.org by David Glover Oh, my love is like a red, red rose that's newly sprung in June. Oh, my love is like a melody that's sweetly played in tune. As fair thou art, my bonny lass, so deep in love am I, and I will love thee still, my dear, till all the seas gang dry. Till all the seas gang dry, my dear, and the rocks melt with the sun, I will love thee still, my dear, when the sands of life shall run. And fare thee well, my lonely love. And fare thee weel a while, and I will come again, my love, though it were ten thousand mile. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Seattle by W. P. Heneage. Read for LibriVox.org by Josh Kibbe. Surely the isles shall wait for thee and the ships of Tarshish first to bring thy sons from afar and thy daughters from the ends of the earth. Pearl of Columbia's far Pacific seaboard, beacon of culture's farthest reaching rays, before thee lies an affluence of record, of deeds and achievements wrought in thy latter days. Say, if the waves that on thy beaches thunder ever have spent themselves on fairer sands than thine, 
tell if jove's bolts which drive the trees asunder ever have fleshed themselves in statelier pine giant of fair columbia's hardy offspring tire of commerce babylon of trade by faith i see thy fast approaching day spring thy wealth thy beauty pure in the decades laid for not in vain the furnace smokes and smoulders with throes of titans under etna hurled and atlas here must square again his shoulders to bear anew the burden of a world lodestar that shapes the carrier vessel's motion inspired i read thy greatness without bound thy marts thy navies gliding through the ocean and thou thyself the queen of puget sound end of poem this recording is in the public domain Shadow March by Robert Louis Stevenson Read for LibriVox.org by Colleen McMahon All around the house is the jet-black night. It stares through the window pane. It creeps in the corners, hiding from the light. And it moves with the moving flame. Now my little heart goes a-beating like a drum, With the breath of the bogey in my hair, While all around the candle the crooked shadows come, And go marching along up the stair. The shadow of the baluster, the shadow of the light, the shadow of the child that goes to bed. All the wicked shadows come a tramp, 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 with the black night overhead. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Shining of the Sea by Friedrich Hebel Read for LibriVox.org by Newgate Novelist From the waves of ocean darkling, rose of old the goddess bright, O'er the world in beauty sparkling, changing darkness into light. Then the sea, its waves restraining, mirror-like its surface glassed, Thus her lovely form retaining, when herself away had passed. With a smile, her gaze inclining, thence there gleamed one parting ray, and the sea has kept it shining, keeps it to the present day. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Solitude of Alexander Selkirk by William Cowper Read for LibriVox.org by Phil Schempf. I am the monarch of all I survey. My right there is none to dispute. From the center all round to the sea, I am lord of the foul and the brute. O oh, solitude, where are the charms that sages have seen in thy face? Better dwell in the midst of alarms than reign in this horrible place. I am out of humanity's reach. I must finish my journey alone. Never hear the sweet music of speech. I start at the sound of my own. The beasts that roam over the plain, my form with indifference see. They are so unacquainted with man, their tameness is shocking to me. Society, friendship, and love, divinely bestowed upon man. Oh, had I the wings of a dove, how soon would I taste you again? My sorrows I then might assuage in the ways of religion and truth, might learn from the wisdom of age and be cheered by the sallies of youth. Ye winds that have made me your sport, convey to this desolate shore some cordial endearing report of a land I shall visit no more. My friends, do they now and then send a wish or a thought after me? Oh, tell me, I yet have a friend, though a friend I am never to see. How fleet is a glance of the mind, compared with the speed of its flight, the tempest itself lags behind, and the swift-winged arrows of light. When I think of my own native land, in a moment I seem to be there. But alas, recollection at hand soon hurries me back to despair. But the sea-fowl is gone to her nest, and the beast is laid down in his lair. Even here is a season of rest, and I to my cabin repair. There's mercy in every place, and mercy, 
encouraging thought gives even affliction a grace and reconciles man to his lot end of poem this recording is in the public domain spirit song over the waters by johann goethe 1774 read for LibriVox.org. The soul of man resembleth water, from heaven it cometh, to heaven it soareth, and then again to earth descendeth, changing ever. Down from the lofty rocky wall streams the bright flood, then spreadeth gently in cloudy billows o'er the smooth rock and welcomed kindly veiling on roams it soft murmuring toward the abyss cliffs projecting oppose its progress angrily foams it down to the bottom step by step now in flat channel through the meadowland steals it and in the polished lake each constellation joyously peepeth wind is the loving wooer of waters wind blends together billows all foaming spirit of man thou art like unto water fortune of man thou art like unto wind end of poem this recording is in the public domain Stanzas written in Dejection Near Naples by Percy Bysshe Shelley Read for LibriVox.org by Jeffrey Wilson, Ames, Iowa The sun is warm, the sky is clear, the waves are dancing fast and bright. Blue isles and snowy mountains wear the purple noon's transparent might. The breath of the moist earth is light around its unexpanded buds. Like many a voice of one delight, the winds, the birds, the ocean floods, the city's voice itself is soft like solitudes. I see the deep's untrampled floor with green and purple seaweed strewn. I see the waves upon the shore like light dissolved in star showers thrown. I sit upon the sands alone. The lightning of the noontide ocean is flashing round me and a tone arises from its measured motion. How sweet did any heart now share in my emotion. Alas, I have nor hope nor health, nor peace within nor calm around, nor that content surpassing wealth the sage in meditation found and walked with inward glory crowned. Nor fame, nor power, nor love, nor leisure, others I see whom these surround. Smiling they live, and call life pleasure. To me that cup has been dealt in another measure. Yet now despair itself is mild, even as the winds and waters are. I could lie down like a tired child, and weep away the life of care which I have borne and yet must bear, till death like sleep might steal on me, and I might feel in the warm air my cheek grow cold and hear the sea breathe o'er my dying brain its last monotony. Some might lament that I were cold, as I when this sweet day is gone, which my lost heart too soon grown old insults with this untimely moan. They might lament, for I am one whom men love not and yet regret, unlike this day which when the sun shall on its stainless glory set, will linger though enjoyed like joy in memory yet. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Surf by Jurgis Badrushaitis Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter The day's wild ocean sings and thunders 
and beats against the fatal shore. This breaker with dumb sorrow sunders, and these like laughing victors roar. Their sheen, the joy of vernal wonders, their sheen, vast winter's shining hoar. In wrath triumphant forward swinging, the lifted billow calls and fails, a joyous giant shouting, singing, its voice the voice of sounding gales, its glory in the sunlight flinging, whose noonday glow it holds and hails. Across the sea, now lightly foaming, another rears that stirs the deep and floods the shore with silence gloaming. Morose and slow it seems to creep, like one who drops, worn out with roaming, from his bent back a fatal heap. Each moment new, with changing power, the surf is thundering, alone. Now idle, now it seems to lower, hymning a silence all unknown, like a dark heart asleep, for hour on hour in restless monotone. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Tables Turned by William Wordsworth. Read for LibriVox.org by Sam Haddad. Up, up, my friend, and clear your looks. Why all this toil and trouble? Up, up, my friend, and quit your books, or surely you'll grow double. The sun above the mountain's head, a freshening lustre mellow, through all the long green fields has spread his first sweet evening yellow. Books, tis dull and endless strife. Come, hear the woodland linnet. How sweet is music! On my life, there's more of wisdom in it. And hark how blithe the throstle sings, and he is no mean preacher. Come forth into the light of things. Let nature be your teacher. She has a world of ready wealth, our minds and hearts to bless. Spontaneous wisdom breathed by health, truth breathed by cheerfulness. One impulse from a vernal wood may teach you more of man, of moral evil and of good, than all the sages can. Sweet is the law which nature brings, our meddling intellect, misshapes the beauteous forms of things we murder to dissect. Enough of science and of art, close up these barren leaves, come forth and bring with you a heart that watches and receives. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Thursday by Edna St. Vincent Millay Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp And if I loved you Wednesday, well, what is that to you? I do not love you Thursday, so much is true. And why you come complaining is more than I can see. I loved you Wednesday, yes, but what is that to me? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To a Gentleman by Samuel Taylor Coleridge, 1772-1834 Read for LibriVox.org Composed on the night after his recital of a poem on the growth of an individual mind. Friend of the wise, and teacher of the good, Into my heart have I received that lay more than historic, That prophetic lay, wherein high theme for thee first sung aright, Of the foundations and the building up of a human spirit, Thou hast dared to tell what may be told, To the understanding mind revealable, and what within the mind by vital breathings secret as the soul of vernal growth oft quickens in the heart thoughts all too deep for words theme hard as high of smiles spontaneous and mysterious fears the first-born they of reason and twin birth of tides obedient to external force 
and currents self-determined as might seem or by some inner power of moments awful now in thy inner life and now abroad when power streamed from thee and thy soul received the light reflected as a light bestowed of fancies fair and milder hours of youth hyblean murmurs of poetic thought industrious in its joy in vales and glens native or outland lakes and famous hills or on the lonely high road when the stars were rising or by secret mountain streams the guides and the companions of thy way of more than fancy of the social sense distending wide and man beloved as man where france in all her town lay vibrating like some becalmed bark beneath the burst of heaven's immediate thunder when no cloud is visible or shadow on the main for thou wert there thine own brows garlanded amid the tremor of a realm aglow amid a mighty nation jubilant when from the general heart of humankind hope sprang forth like a full-born deity of that dear hope afflicted and struck down so summoned homeward thenceforth calm and sure from the dread watch-tower of man's absolute self with light unwavering on her eyes to look far on herself a glory to behold the angel of the vision then last strain of duty chosen laws controlling choice action and joy an orphic song indeed a song divine of high and passionate thoughts to their own music chanted o great bard ere yet that last strain dying awed the air with steadfast eye i viewed thee in the choir of ever enduring men the truly great have all one age and from one visible space shed influence they both in power and act are permanent and time is not with them save as it worketh for them they in it nor less a sacred role than those of old and to be placed as they with gradual fame among the archives of mankind thy work makes audible a linked lay of truth of truth profound a sweet continuous lay not learnt but native her own natural notes ah as i listened with the heart forlorn the pulses of my being beat anew and even as life returns upon the drowned life's joy rekindled roused a throng of pains keen pangs of love awakening as a babe turbulent with an outcry in the heart and fears self-willed that shunned the eye of hope and hope that scarce would know itself from fear sense of past youth and manhood come in vain and all which i had culled in wood-walks wild and all which patient toil had reared and all commune with thee had opened out but flowers strewn on my course and borne upon my bier in the same coffin for the self-same grave that way no more and ill beseems it me who became a welcomer in herald's guise singing of glory and futurity to wander back on such unhealthful road plucking the poisons of self-harm and ill such intertwine beseems triumphant wreaths strewed before thy advancing nor do thou sage bard impair the memory of that hour of my communion with thy nobler mind by pity or grief already felt too long nor let my words import more blame than needs the tumult rose and ceased for peace is nigh where wisdom's voice has found a listening heart 
amid the howl of more than wintry storms the halcyon hears the voice of vernal hours already on the wing eve following eve dear tranquil time when the sweet sense of home is sweetest moments for their own sake hailed and more desired more precious for thy song in silence listening like a devout child my song lay passive by the various strain driven as in surges now beneath the stars with momentary stars of my own birth fair constellated foam still darting off into the darkness now a tranquil sea outspread and bright yet swelling to the moon and when o friend my comforter and guide strong in thyself and powerful to give strength thy long sustained song finally closed and thy deep voice had ceased yet thou thyself wert still before my eyes and round us both that happy vision of beloved faces scarce conscious and yet conscious of its close i sate my being blended in one thought thought was it or aspiration or resolve absorbed yet hanging still upon the sound and when i arose i found myself in prayer end of poem this recording is in the public domain Transformations by Thomas Hardy Read for LibriVox.org by Ian King Portion of this you Is a man my grandsire knew Bosomed here at its foot This branch may be his wife A ruddy human life Now turned to a green shoot These grasses must be made Of her who often prayed Last century for repose and the fair girl long ago, whom I often tried to know, may be entering this rose. So they are not underground, but as nerves and veins abound in the growths of upper air, and they feel the sun and rain and the energy again that made them what they were. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Will It Be Like This? by Miriam Allen DeFord Read for LibriVox.org by Colleen McMahon Will it be like this, climbing the hill at midnight while the rain seeps from the plumaged pepper trees and the damp air is rank with eucalyptus and our little house black and untenanted soundless where your hurrying footsteps used to run to the door to greet me black and cold and i alone there will that be the way of it on that silent day when i shall begin waiting for death to release me to you end of poem this recording is in the public domain the year of the rose by algernon charles swinburne Read for LibriVox.org by Jeffrey Wilson, Ames, Iowa. From the depths of the green garden closes, Where the summer in darkness dozes, Till autumn pluck from his hand An hourglass that holds not a sand. From the maze that a flower belt encloses To the stones and sea grass on the strand, How red was the rain of the roses Over the rose-crowned land. The year of the rose is brief, from the first blade blown to the sheaf, from the thin green leaf to the gold, it has time to be sweet and grow old, to triumph and leave not a leaf for witness in winter's sight, how lovers once in the light would mix their breath with its breath, and its spirit was quenched not of night, as love is subdued not of death. In the red rose land not a mile of the meadows from stile to stile, of the valleys from stream to stream, 
but the air was a long sweet dream and the earth was a sweet wide smile red mouths of a goddess returned from the sea which had borne her and burned that with one swift smile of her mouth looked full on the north as it yearned and the north was more than the south for the north when winter was long in his heart had made him a song and clothed it with wings of desire and shod it with shoon as of fire to carry the tale of his wrong to the southwest wind by the sea that none might bear it but he to the ear of the goddess unknown who waits till her time shall be to take the world for a throne in the earth beneath and above in the heaven where her name is love she warms with light from her eyes the seasons of life as they rise and her eyes are as eyes of a dove but the wings that lift her and bear as an eagle's and all her hair as fire by the wind's breath curled and her passage is song through the air and her presence is spring through the world so turned she northward and came and the white thorn land was aflame with the fires that were shed from her feet that the north by her love made sweet should be called by a rose-red name and a murmur was heard as of doves and a music beginning of loves in the light that the roses made such light as the music loves the music of man with maid but the days drop one upon one and a chill soft wind is begun in the heart of the rose-red maze that weeps for the rose-leaf days and the reign of the rose undone that ruled so long in the light and by spirit and not by sight through the darkness thrilled with its breath still ruled in the viewless night as love might rule over death the time of lovers is brief from the fair first joy to the grief that tells when love is grown old from the warm wild kiss to the cold from the red to the white rose leaf they have but a season to seem as rose leaves lost on a stream that part not and pass not apart as a spirit from dream to dream as a sorrow from heart to heart from the bloom and the gloom that encloses the deathbed of love where he dozes till a relic be left not of sand to the hourglass that breaks in his hand from the change in the grey garden closes to the last stray grass of the strand a rain and ruin of roses over the red rose land end of poem this recording is in the public domain you cannot put a fire out by emily dickinson Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp You cannot put a fire out. A thing that can ignite can go itself without a fan upon the slowest night. You cannot fold a flood and put it in a drawer because the winds would find it out and tell your cedar floor. And a poem? This recording is in the public domain.